remarks. Our second speaker this evening is Jed Carney. Jed is the president of the ACTU, a position she commenced in July 2010. Uh, prior to that, Jed was the federal secretary of the Australian Nursing Federation. Uh, Jed brings to us this evening the belief that unions should not just be concerned with the experience of people at work, but that they should be advocates for change to improve all aspects of Australians' lives. So it is in that spirit that she's going to uh, talk to us about the role she sees unions have, have in terms of uh, beyond a carbon price. Thanks, Serena, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, actually, what I'm going to talk about tonight is a little bit of a follow-on, really, uh, from, uh, the, from John's premise that there are opportunities, there are great opportunities in a clean energy um, future for us, and particularly, I am going to talk about the, uh, the opportunities for jobs. Because already workers and their families are experiencing the consequences of insufficient action on climate change. There's no doubt about that. In 2008, the United Nations Development Report indicated that some 262 million people were affected by climate disasters annually from 2000 to 2004. Over 98% of those affected live in developing countries, as you would know. <coughs> However, there are also risks for developed countries, with one in 1,500 people living in OECD countries actually affected by climate disaster. Australia is a developed country particularly at risk of climate change due to our geography, due to our climate, and due to our environment. And as such, workers, of course, and their families are at risk. And for us, it would be incorrect to assume that it is just workers in agriculture that are affected. More extreme weather events, like the floods in Thailand last year, affect all workers. Almost all major industrial sites in and around Bangkok were evacuated and thousands of workers lost their livelihoods. This had serious implications, of course, for families trying to cover basic needs, and we are only just beginning to touch on the adverse health impacts that climate change is bringing to developed countries, as indeed uh, less developed countries. And as the environmental challenge worsens, you of course would know these figures, I'm sure, but it is predicted that 1.8 billion people are expected to face water scarcity by 2025. 180 million people will be affected by food shortages. And by 2050, there will be up to 200 million climate refugees. So, if the world continues on its current trajectory and fails to hold temperatures below two degree increase as recognised as necessary, uh, increasingly, workers and their families will be affected. Now this will contribute to what is already a very serious unemployment crisis. Currently, decent work is a major challenge for the world. There are 200 million unemployed people. There are 900 million people who live in poverty. There are 1.52 billion workers in insecure work. Globally, trade unions know acting decisively on climate change is not inconsistent with meeting the unemployment challenge. By responding to climate change, we can respond to the demands of the environment, rising social inequality. And these are two of the greatest challenges of our time. It's important that we don't respond to both of these in isolation. The transition to a low carbon economy can address the environmental challenges we face while creating decent work opportunities. Recent research commissioned by the International Trade Union Movement, completed by the Millennium Institute, shows that investing just 2% of GDP in the green economy of 12 countries and seven industries can create 48 million jobs over just five years. The job creation potential holds true across developed and developing countries and across all countries and all regions, including Australia. In Australia, the report found that up to 920,000, nearly a million jobs could be created over five years in just four sectors. That's energy, construction, manufacturing and transport. 
The job creation potential is consistent with numerous research reports released over the past five years, which show that the Australian economy will continue to grow and jobs will continue to grow as we move to a low carbon economy. I'll mention just two. Research commissioned by the ACTU and the ACF found that an additional 770,000 jobs could be created across the economy and the country by 2030, just by taking action to reduce emissions. In the renewable energy sector alone, modelling by the Climate Institute shows that 34,000 new jobs could be created by 2030. And of course, we are much more fortunate in Australia in that we have not experienced the impact of the economic crises to the extent, of course, of other developed countries in Europe and North America. However, that doesn't mean that in Australia we can sit on our hands. We still need to be focused on a future that is economically, socially and environmentally responsible. We believe that putting a price on carbon pollution is an integral step in responding to the environmental challenge. Carbon pricing is an effective mechanism for driving the transition to a low carbon economy. It will require companies in Australia for the first time to take into account the impacts of energy production and consumption. Acting without a price would require more real resource expenditure to achieve the same pollution reduction objectives as we heard at the beginning of this presentation this evening. However, we know that putting a price on carbon is insufficient and it's essential to go beyond carbon pricing. So, a suite of complementary measures needs to be introduced to support the carbon price, and they have been. And these are important for driving innovation in clean technology and in promoting energy efficiency, and of course, job creation. Domestically, we need to focus on maximising the abatement and job creation potential of these complementary measures. I'll just discuss two very briefly. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation will allocate $10 billion over five years to renewable energy and low emission and energy efficiency technologies. Just in the past couple of weeks, the expert panel for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation released its recommendations. The panel recommended that the corporation have full access to a range of financial instruments that would allow it to tailor support to individual project requirements. Loan guarantees are one of these options. A similar program adopted in the US has seen in two years over $26 billion in loan guarantees to 25 clean energy projects and over $42 billion in project costs. Reports indicate that these have secured almost 60,000 jobs across 20 states. The work of the corporation will be incredibly important as international research shows that there remain financial constraints to participating in clean energy technology, even with the introduction of a carbon price. If we can unlock that investment, there are significant benefits to be made. What we've seen in the, in the UK, for example, the clean tech industry supply chain extends from research and development through manufacturing, in, into distribution, into retail, installation and maintenance services. Despite the GFC, in the UK it is one of the fastest growing industries involving almost 55,000 companies, of which 17,000 are manufacturers. Throughout the supply chain, the industry employs 881,000 workers, with a huge forecast of jobs over the next eight years. While economy-wide manufacturing is 70% of the value of domestic activity, in the clean energy technology sector, manufacturing is 31% of the activity, and the flow-on effect has not yet even been measured. But demonstrating the significant potential for manufacturers to diversify and revitalise their business is going to be crucial. The second complementary measure I'd like to mention is the proposed National Energy Savings Initiative. Now, the government is committed to exploring with the states and territories a coherent and consistent approach to improving energy efficiency. Now, trade unions fully support comprehensive action to improve energy efficiency. It will reduce expenditure on bills, reduce energy demand, contribute to carbon pollution mitigation, improve industry competitiveness. It will reduce the risk of locking in efficient technologies and importantly for us, it will create jobs. Research on energy efficiency measures in which 
a national scheme would drive uptake indicates significant job creation opportunities right across the sectors. For example, in building, uh, we get direct creation of jobs on site, we get indirect creation of jobs uh, through the, uh, the flow on effect through manufacturing, uh, there's induced job growth for, through jobs created as money that would have previously been spent on energy can be reallocated to the community. In the case of retrofitting projects, these will be additional jobs, as without a market mechanism driving energy use efficiency, this work wouldn't exist. The broader the coverage of the scheme, the greater the job opportunities. And finally, this evening, I'd like to briefly turn to the international scene. Australia is well placed to play a progressive leadership role in international negotiations. I find it such an extraordinary argument to say that we should not lead the way. Between now and 2015, Australia can and should work with other progressive governments, utilise our links in the Asian region and promote constructive negotiations. It is in our international and national interests for there to be an ambitious global agreement and ambitious targets are an important part of this. It's now time for this to happen. The domestic action in respective countries is building. Thus, statements that Australia is acting alone, as you all well know, is just not true. In fact, recent research shows that Australia is ranked 16th in its low carbon competitiveness when compared with other G20 nations. However, the sum of current domestic action is insufficient to keep global warming below two degrees. An ambitious global agreement is essential in driving greater domestic action. Australia has a very strong history of effectively engaging in the multilateral system. Why should we stop now? Thank you.